All right, good evening. It is time for us to begin, and uh, we're going to start with a song. Uh, I don't know if we've sung it here. If, if we have, it's been quite some time. Uh, of course, uh, if it happened before three days ago, for me, that was a long time ago uh, sometimes, as far as my memory is concerned. The hymn number, if you have one of our red hymnals, the hymn number is 169, and the name of the hymn is Tell Me the Story of Jesus. We'll sing the first and last verses. <coughs> Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell how the angels in chorus sing as they welcomed his birth. Glory to God in the highest, peace and good tidings to earth. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Tell of the cross where they nailed him, writhing in anguish and pain. Tell of the grave where they laid him, tell how he liveth again. Love in that story so tender, clearer than ever I see. Stay, let me weep while you whisper, love paid the ransom for me. Tell me the story of Jesus, write on my heart every word. Tell me the story most precious, sweetest that ever was heard. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the fact that that's not just a story to us that it is uh, history, it is the uh, demonstration of your love for us and your desire to have us live forever in, in glory with you. Lord, we pray that you'd bless the study of your word tonight, that you would help us to grow as Christians and, and to be better servants uh, for you. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to go over a few announcements and reminders. Uh, we've started uh, easing back into things. Uh, this Sunday morning we'll have services in person again. Again, that'll be for those who, who feel comfortable uh, getting back out and, and gathering together. Uh, I think things went well uh, this past Sunday, and people did a good job at, at uh, uh, giving each other room, and thankful for, for those that were here. What a blessing it was to be uh, together once again. And again, I understand if, if uh, you don't feel quite safe yet to go back out, and uh, we're not going to fault anybody for that. Now, if, if you could go to something else and be comfortable there, you can come here and be comfortable here. And uh, so I know we'll all be careful to not use this as an excuse to not gather uh, together uh, as a church. <clears throat> I want to remind you, as I have been all along, and, and, and not just this, I've, I've been saying God will get us through this. He's going to get us through everything. And that's how I know he's going to get us through this. And uh, um, I, I've read his book, and, and he... He foretold that things like this were going to happen, and this isn't the end. And in fact, for us, we, we don't have an end. We have a, a, a transference. We'll be translated from here to heaven someday, and I'm looking forward to that. I want to encourage you to, to share this link uh, to our YouTube channel with friends, family, people you like, people you don't like. Uh, encourage them to tune in and watch, and, and uh, our prayer and desire is for it to be a blessing to them. For them to have an opportunity to hear the good news of Jesus Christ, how he died on the cross for us but didn't stay dead. His resurrection proves that his sacrifice was accepted by God as payment for our sins. And what a great, uh, uh, what a great proof that is. Other uh, founders of religions 
Uh, you can go visit their graves and they're still occupied. Their remains are still there, but the founder of ours, you can visit, uh, but he only used that tomb for, for a few days. <clears throat> Somebody said he used it for the weekend and not even the whole weekend um, at that, but uh, it's empty to this very day, a testimony to his power over death. That's, uh, that's the leader I want to follow, the one that has, that has had victory like that. I want to remind you of our service times. Of course, Sunday morning at 1045, we're going to start right at 1045. We're going to keep that. Uh, now, we won't be live streaming Sunday morning. <clears throat> we will record it. <clears throat> Excuse me. We'll record it and then post that after the services as soon as I can get it off the camera, onto my laptop, and off of my laptop and into the YouTube uh, hard drives or servers, whatever it is they have there, and then they'll, uh, they do a little processing on it, and then they go ahead and post it. So it could be an hour or two after the services are over uh, by the time that gets posted. But if you have subscribed and, and uh, clicked on the notification icon, you should get a notification of, of every time something new is posted uh, or when something is scheduled to, to show up. Uh, so Sunday morning at 1045, Sunday night at 7, and Wednesday evening at 730. And uh, we'll keep those times for now. Our services Sunday morning will be uh, entirely in the auditorium. We won't have nursery or, or any junior church or Sunday school uh, at this time. We will be working at, at uh, getting back into those things, but we'll start uh, back together uh, once again uh, this Sunday. So welcome you to, to join us. If you've not ever attended with us, our location is 510 Park Avenue in Cardington. I want to remind you to pray for the uh, pastors, especially our pastor of the month this month is Brother Lance and uh, pastor of Calvary Baptist Church in Bucyrus. And so keep him in your prayers. You don't have to pray just once a week, but at least if you're going to pray, pray at least once a week. And then uh, it may be that God reminds you at some other point in the week, hey, it, you need to pray for Brother Lance and go ahead. It won't take you but, but a few seconds. And and uh, you say, well, I don't know what to pray for. The, the wonderful thing is God knows exactly what he needs. And so you can, you can tell God, say, God, I don't know what he needs and, and uh, what his situation is, but, uh, but you do. And so I ask that you'd give him uh, what would be best for him and trust God's wisdom in that. Uh, you'll never go wrong by doing that. Uh, and, and maybe you could pray for things that, that you'd like to have. Um, and I don't mean necessarily things, uh, but uh, the important things in life. Say, God, give him the kind of marriage I'd like to have. And, and bless his kids the way I'd like to have my kids blessed. And, and use their family and, and uh, their work and their ministry for your honor and glory. Things like that. He has specifically requested prayer for wisdom. And so you could start with that. That's always a good thing. Uh, the Bible says that in, in everything that we get, our main getting should be to get to go after wisdom. So pray for him. Of course, uh, Brother Dan Dornbeer was last month's pastor, and Brother Chris Bray was the month before that. Uh, and you're welcome, and, and I encourage you to continue to pray for them as well. Uh, since we're not meeting in person, we're not able to take up offerings here at the church, but uh, uh, many of you have been mailing those in. We certainly appreciate that. God bless you. If you'd like to mail uh, an offering or tithe in, uh, if this is your church, uh, this is where you ought to be tithing. And uh, if you don't have a church, well, we, we, won't, turn, we won't turn it away. Uh, we'd invite you to come and, and visit with us, and uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions you have. Um, if you, like I said, since a lot of churches aren't having services in person, if you don't feel comfortable visiting in person, uh, I can be reached at 740-244-2268, and uh, love to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, regarding the church, the, the Bible. If you have prayer requests, uh, share those with me. I uh, <clears throat> uh, had, had a call just yesterday. Uh, I've got the number posted on the front door of the church, and I got a phone call just yesterday from somebody. It was a FedEx man. He said, is this 520 Park Avenue? I said, no, sir. Uh, the church address is 510 Park Avenue. So I think he was looking for the apartment buildings next door. Uh, but I did get a phone call. Uh, anyhow, so if you'd like to mail in offerings, as I was saying, our mail address is P.O. Box 125, Cardington, Ohio, and that's, of course, 43315. Uh, any checks or money orders, you'd need to make those out to Cardington Baptist Temple. That way, those can be deposited right into the church account. All right, let's get into the Bible study at this time. Uh, we are continuing from where we left off last week. Uh, we've been 
studying and looking at different aspects of the Christian life, or different, different aspects of Christianity, if you will. Uh, but not just Christianity in general, but, but the Christian life, the life of each individual Christian, things that the different facets and, and parts of our lives that we should be working on and striving to, uh, uh, to bring into conform, uh, conformity with God's will and His Word. Uh, let's, let's look back in the Bible. We're going to review, I'm not going to spend much time at all in review. Uh, last week's message or lesson is, is online. Uh, and, and so that makes it, that'll cut the review time down. You can just go and if you haven't yet watched that or seen it, I encourage you to do so. And we'll pretty much pick up. We're going to look at two passages and then we'll just pick up where we left off last week. Our first passage is John 3.16, very well known, uh, very familiar verse. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Our next passage is 1 Corinthians 10.31, and it says, Whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. And let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word, uh, for uh, those that have uh, tuned in and, and are gathered around, uh, some telephones, some uh, maybe computer screens, or even on their TV sets. Lord, we pray that you'll bless this time that we spend in, in hearing from you. I pray your Holy Spirit will speak to us and use me and that your will would be accomplished, uh, that you may get glory out of uh, not just this, this message, but out of our lives in every way. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. These verses at first glance don't seem to have much to do with each other, and, and really they don't, uh, uh, they don't uh, but they do illustrate uh, a truth. And we, we started talking last week about the Christian and his motives. And in John 3.16, the Bible talks, you know, that's the gospel right there. Uh, and God appeals to our selfish motive of not wanting to die, but, but rather wanting to have everlasting life. He says, well, I sent my son so you could have that. And so he says, if, and, and most people, I haven't ever yet met anybody that got saved because they looked at their life and studied it and said, God's just not getting enough glory out of my life. They got saved so that they wouldn't have to go to hell and they got saved so that they could go to heaven. And, and so in one thing, they took care of two problems. And that's the initial motivation. People get saved with a selfish motivation. And, but God says what we need to be moving towards and the, the goal for our motivation should be whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And so where we may not have gotten saved initially for the glorification of God, our salvation in our life should eventually get to the point where it is causing us to glorify God. And so, as I, as I mentioned last week, God's not just interested in what we do, or He's not interested in just what we do. He, he's also interested in the why that we do it, our motives, if you will. Um, I, I'm just going to read over I said I wasn't going to review a whole lot. I'm not. I'm just going to read the, the first three points. I said, first of all, we are enticed to become Christians by selfish motives. Number two, I said the ultimate in motives is right here in 1 Corinthians 10, 31. That's the goal. That's what we need to be striving to, to move towards. That's where we want to arrive at. And number three, we won't arrive there this side of glory. Uh, we still have our sinful nature, our, the frailties of, the, of our flesh, and our, our natural leaning towards what's wrong. So we won't, we won't have 100% pure, perfect motives this side of heaven. Now, uh, let's move into a new point tonight. Uh, number four, in this life, uh, number four, we should be on our way. We won't arrive there uh, until we go to heaven, but we, we need to be moving in that direction. We should be on our way. In this life, we'll never totally purify our motives. They won't be... 100% pure on, on this side of heaven. Uh, and and let, me, let me kind of lay out what the path is. The path that we're on, it starts out with what things mean to me. How does it affect me? Or how does that help me? How does that impact my life? How does that uh, uh, improve my situation? And, and the motives are, are about me. What, what this thing, I'm going to do this and and or or not do this and it's based on the effect that it has on me then that the next step 
as we move down this road from going from selfish to having the right motive, the next step is, well, what it means to others. We'll begin to consider other people. We become a little bit less self-centered, self-focused, and now how does this affect somebody else? And, and uh, then the next step is what it means to God. And that's the one where we want to, uh, that's where we want to arrive. Um, what does it mean to God? So first of all, it's for me, for others, and then our, our focus, our interest, our desire is the glory of God. And the glory of God is, is where we're headed. That's, that's the goal. That's the, the finish line, if you will. Uh, but there's a stopover between where we start out, living for ourselves, and arriving at the glory of God. That stopover in the middle, that's living for somebody else. And so while that's not the goal, that is better than living for yourself. People that live for themselves uh, end, up, end up very lonely and bitter. And so it, better than living for yourself is living for somebody else, living for others, uh, spending your life, your energy, uh, and, and your means for others. But the ultimate goal is to live our lives for God. Now, we're never fully going to arrive there, but we should be on our way. We should be pointed in that direction, and we should be taking steps whether they're small steps, big steps, giant steps, giant leaps, bounds, you know, th that's up to you. And, and that's for you and God to work out. God wants us to get there as quickly as we can. And, and he'll help us to do that, but he, does, he won't ever force us to do so. So we're on our way. And while we're on our way, while we're on our way, we should go ahead and be obedient to God. Don't wait to obey until you can do so with purely unselfish motives. Now go ahead and serve God now. Go ahead and obey God selfishly while you work on your motives. There's, you know, there's, it's, it's easier to work on one thing at a time. And if you can get one thing down to where you can kind of not have to exert all your energy and all your attention on that, then you can kind of Put that on automatic, if you will. You, you get that that uh, uh, that wheel rolling. And you say, okay, now it just takes a little bit to get that. I remember one time, this is a good example of this. I remember one time going to the circus, and they had this fella with a stack of plates. And he had a big stack of plates on the table. And then he had a whole bunch of these long sticks. I mean, three or four foot long sticks. Some of them, some of them much longer than that. And he would set a plate on top of that stick and start it spinning. And, and he'd get that thing spinning. He'd, he'd, he'd hold the stick and he'd just hit the side of that plate and get that plate. Then it was balanced on top of that stick. And the stick had, a, there's a, I don't know if there was a hole in the table or something, where it would just stand up and hold that plate. And then he'd get another plate and get it. Now, he didn't go on to the next one until he had the first one going, going well. And then he added another one. And then he would go back and pay just a little bit of attention to the first one, and then the second one, and then he'd get a third one. Pretty soon he had, I don't know, about a dozen plates or so, and all of those, and he always had to go back and just uh, pay a little bit of attention to each one. And, and that's the thing. We, while we're moving there, let's not wait until, well, I can't obey until I can do it perfectly. If you're waiting for perfection, you're not going to achieve that on your own. And you're not going to achieve that this side of heaven. Everything down here is contaminated. It's contaminated by sin. And our own sinful nature. It's not just Satan. It, we're born with a, with a sinful nature, with a tendency and a desire, uh, with a um, uh, predilection to do wrong. And, and so don't wait until you can, until your motives are going to be pure and unselfish to start serving God. Go ahead and start serving God. Start obeying whatever your motives are. Get that plate going and, and get it spinning or get that wheel turning. And then once it's turning, you may just have to nudge that a little bit every once in a while, but that starts building that to where it becomes a habit. And then once that's a habit, or even before it's a habit, but you're but you're already got that going, you say, okay, I'm being obedient. Then you can start working on your attitude in your obedience. So let, let me give an example. You tell a kid, you tell a kid, I want you to clean your room. And the kid says, I'm not in the mood to do that right now. 
I don't care what mood you're in. Clean your room in a bad mood if you have to, but I want the room cleaned. Now, the parent would much rather the child clean the room and have a good attitude. But they don't want to wait for the room to be clean for that child to develop a good attitude because otherwise it, it's really not ever going to get done. It's not ever going to get done. As the child cleans the room, bad attitude and all, and then the next day or the next week or whenever it needs cleaned, you know, whenever it's on the schedule to be cleaned again, they clean the room again, they clean the room again, they clean the room again. And, you know, before you know it, they're in there cleaning the room without having to be told and made to do it, and, and they're singing a song, or they're whistling, or they're humming, or, and, and their attitude has changed in that obedience. Go ahead and obey God, selfishly if you have to, and once you get started on obey, in other words, don't wait until you, you have all your attitude, your motive, and everything perfect before coming to church. God said to not forsake the assembly of ourselves together. Now, we're kind of assembled in a virtual way, and, and uh, we're going to get back together in person, and, and, and we're going to do that. Um, but go ahead. You know, the Bible says God loves a cheerful giver. Don't wait to be cheerful to give. Turn, turn, let's go to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. This is one of the most well-known verses or passages about, uh, about tithing. It's further back than it was before. All right, Malachi 3, uh, verse 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, Wherein have we robbed thee? In tithes and offerings. Then he says this, Ye are cursed with a curse. For ye have robbed me, even this whole nation. This is, you're, he said, you're going through some problems. You're cursed right now because you robbed me. This is what God is saying to the, to the nation of Israel. To, well, to anybody who has failed to tithe, them, uh, tithe to him. Now, verse 10, he says this. And, and I want you to think about this. While we're reading this, realize God is appealing to the very selfish nature that he knows man has. He says, bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse. Well, why would I do that? Why does God need my money? Why, why would I bring all my tithes into his storehouse? And he says, that there may need meat in mine house. Well, why would I care if there's meat in his house? What about my house? How does that, now, here's the first step in the whole thing. How does that help me? How does that affect me? How does that impact my life? He says, well, here's what, here's what it'll do. He says, prove me now here with, saith the Lord of hosts, if I want to not open you the windows of heaven. He said, uh, he said, you go ahead and do that, and here's what I'll do for you. I'll open up the windows of heaven. Now, a window is something that you use to see from one place to another. If there's no window, then there's a whole world that you're not able to see. There's a whole realm out there that, that is outside of your, your sight. And so God says, I'll let you see things that you wouldn't have been able to see without having tithe. Well, that'd be a good, uh, that'd be a good power to have. That'd be a good blessing. He said, not only that, he said, uh, and pour you out a blessing that there shall not be room enough to receive it. He said, I'm going to give you such a blessing, there's not going to be room for you to receive it. It's going to have to go down generations. Verse 11, he says, And I will rebuke the devourer for your sakes, and he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground. Neither shall your vine cast her fruit before the time uh, before the time in the field, saith the Lord. And all nations shall call you blessed, for you shall be a delightsome land, saith the Lord of hosts. Now all these are blessings, all these are enticements, all these are appeals to our selfish nature. Well, there's all manner of promises here. And we can, we can start because of his promises and because of God having commanded it. We can start tithing. And we can say, my motive for tithing is, I like the sound of these blessings. I like that, I like that idea. And I'm kind of afraid of the curse of failing to tithe. Uh, that doesn't appeal to me at all. 
And so because of our selfish nature, we begin tithing. But that needs to transform, that, that needs to move along into, I'm doing this for God's glory. I'm doing this because God's important to me. I'm doing this because, because I want Him honored. Now, number five, while we are on our way, and I've, I've kind of been making this statement already, while we're on our way, we should obey the commands of God regardless of our motives. Regardless of our motives. If we wait to live for God until after we have all of our ducks in a row, it'll never get done. First of all, we don't even know how many ducks we have. So we would never know if they were all in a row or not. We'd see two lined up and say, I got it. And God said, you got 134 more behind you that you haven't even noticed that were there. And so, so it's a ridiculous idea or concept. Once I get everything just right, boy, it's just everything's so chaotic in my life right now, I can't go to church. Don't wait till there's peace and tranquility and perfect order in your life before darkening the door of a church building. It'll never happen. Well, it's, I, I just, uh, I, I, there's just too much going on. Don't wait till it calms down. It'll never happen. It'll never happen. You go ahead and obey. Well, I just, I just don't feel like it. I just, uh, uh, I'm just angry. I'm just upset. I'm just bitter. Whatever. I just have a bad attitude. Well, come to church with your bad attitude. Think about it. If, if we tell our kids, I want you to clean your room. I can't right now, Dad. I have a bad attitude. <laughs> oh, well, I... I'm so sorry. I never knew. I never knew. I never knew that a bad attitude was a, was a, a disqualifier for obedience. The fact of the matter is, it isn't. It isn't. You know, when, there's so much that can be learned about our relationship with God from our relationship with our children. And we need to... We need to examine the excuses we use with God and say, would I, use, would I accept that as a valid excuse from my son or from my daughter? The fact of the matter is, having the wrong motives does not excuse disobedience. Obey while you're obeying. While you're obeying. You start coming to church, and, and I think you'll realize, you know, these people aren't so bad after all. They're just like me. They're just people. They're just people. Well, we're not here putting on airs. There's nobody here that thinks they're anybody better than anybody else. We're just people. The people that get to thinking they're better than somebody else, they get to feeling uncomfortable. Nobody makes them uncomfortable go out of their way. The Holy Spirit convicts them. They'll blame it on everybody around them, but the fact of the matter is that's God telling them, hey, you're not any better than the person next to you. While you're obeying, once you get that wheel rolling, start working on your motives. Start working on that attitude. Start working on that, that uh, why is it that I'm doing this? See, what happens is as you obey, you will grow in grace, and your motives naturally will become holy and sanctified. It's just, it's, it's, a, it's a byproduct of the obedience. You know, when I was little, I obeyed my dad pretty much because I was afraid not to. Uh, I, I knew what the consequences would be for my disobedience. And I feared those consequences. And so that was a very selfish motive for me obeying my dad. Dad would say, do something, and and there's a lot of times I didn't feel like doing that. I felt like playing. I felt like doing something else. And, and, uh, but I realized, you know what? More, the, the, more than my desire to not do it was my desire to be able to sit down comfortably. Now, as an adult, I would have done anything he asked of me. And not out of fear for him, but rather out of love and respect. Now, without the obedience in my youth, I don't believe I would have arrived at the love and respect in adulthood. If, I had a, if, if my dad had allowed a bad attitude in me to, to keep me disobedient, 
if he would have if he would have uh, accepted that as a reason for disobedience I never would have gotten around to obedience and by never getting around to obedience the relate we, we wouldn't have gotten to the relationship that we had that we enjoyed uh, and, and so while I didn't feel like doing it I did it and then later on when he said hey can you help me out with this I'd love to I'd be glad to let's, let's think about these the uh, some some other illustrations some other examples here you know when, when my wife first caught my eye I became interested in her I did not want to date her to help her glorify God more. That was not my motive at all. That was, uh, well, it never entered my mind. Uh, I wanted to date her because she was pretty and she appealed to me. It's a completely selfish motivation. Now, after more than 30 years later, my desire to please her and help her and serve her has increased. I'm not saying that's 100% my motivation now. I'm, I'm still moving in that direction. I'm, but I like to think I've grown in that time and, and that my motives have, have uh, matured some. In every area of our lives, we start out with selfish motives. God knows that. God, God knows us better than we know ourselves. That's where we start. That's where we start. But it's important to not stay there. It's important to not say, this is where I'm going to build my house, my forever house, and this is where I'm going to live. No. This is where I'm going to start. But I don't want to live at the start line. I want to, I want to build my house at the finish line. Obey and grow. As we obey, that puts us on the path. We'll begin to be more aware of others. Then beyond that, we'll begin to focus more on what does God want? How does this affect his reputation? How does this give him glory in my life? Number six, number six, never judge another's motives. Never, ever, ever, ever judge another's motives. Well, I hear people speculating on why others did this and why they did that and why they did what they did, but the fact is, you don't know their reasoning. You don't. You don't know their heart. And, and really, when it comes right down to it, it might very well be that they are doing the very thing that you would be doing if you were in their shoes. Be, be very, very careful about that. Well, if I was them, I wouldn't do it that way. Well, that might be true. If you were them, you might do it worse. And it's awful arrogant to think, if I was them, I would be perfect. But you're not perfect being you. Why, why do you think you could attain perfection in somebody else's shoes? That, that's, uh, that's ridiculous. The, the, the fact is, we should all be on the road to have our motives being pure. We all need to be moving in that direction, going down that way. But none of us have arrived. Some are striving. Some don't seem to be. But as, as we travel that road, let's be very careful to not judge another who may not be as far down the road as we think they should be. You know, there just might be somebody looking back at us and saying, how come they're not further down this road than they ought to be? I hope that's not the case. I hope the people that are down the road further than I am are mature enough to not look back at me and judge me. The way to make that the case is to make sure I'm at a point where I'm mature enough to not look back at the ones who haven't made it as far as I have and judge them. Be very careful. You don't know that. You don't know their heart. The fact is, you don't know your own heart. How could you know somebody else's? The heart is above all things most deceitful. 
all things and most. That's what the Bible, that's what God told us. He says, your, your heart, you don't know it. God knows our heart. There's nothing that deceives him. There's nothing that tricks him. There's nothing that gets past him. He knows our heart better than we do. And since I can't 100% know my own heart even, boy, how arrogant it would be for me to think that I could know someone else's heart. And then to judge them on that. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever judge. Don't ever judge. Allow them room to grow. Encourage them. Cheer them on. Say, come on, let's go. Let's do something for the glory of God. Let's live our lives in a way that, that enhances his reputation. To, to glory in something means to brag about something. Paul said, I will, I will glory only in the cross. He said, if I'm going to brag about something, I'm going to brag about what happened for me at the cross of Calvary. Jesus died, shed his blood there to pay the price for my sins. And because of his death and resurrection, I can go to heaven. He said, that's the only thing worth bragging about. God. God's greatness. God's goodness. God's love. What was happening there at the cross? For God so loved the world. That's what was happening at the cross. That he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God understands that that's where we're going to start. God knows that. He doesn't fault us for it. That would be like a, a, a parent looking at a one-year-old, 18-month-old child and say, why aren't you running the marathon yet? What's the matter with you? No. As parents, we know they're going to start with wobbly legs. And they're going to take a few steps and then just plop down. And we're going to encourage them to get back up again, get back up and urge them to, to go. Somebody said we spend the first two years teaching them how to walk and talk and the rest of their life at, at our house to sit down and be quiet. And, and I know that's, that's just a joke, but, but really we do spend so much time and energy to help them walk, to encourage them. And it's not bashing them. And God knows that we're just learning how to get up on our feet and walk. And he entices us. He encourages us. Parents will look at their child and say, come here, look, I've got the toy for you. And they hold the toy up or, or something that, that will be appealing to the selfishness of that child and, and draw them towards them as they're trying to teach them to walk and launch out and start taking steps. But we don't do that for them the rest of their life. That, that gets them started. And then eventually we want them to kind of take over on themselves and motivate themselves to walk from one place to another. And God gets us started and he entices us to get saved, but he wants us to not just stay there, but to move along and our life to be lived in such a way that everything that we do brings honor and glory to him. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for being a God that is worthy of all glory. Lord, thank you that we'll never go wrong in, in any amount of bragging that we do upon you. We'll never go wrong in living our life in such a way that brings you glory. We pray that uh, you'll watch over us. Uh, be with us throughout the rest of this week. We pray that you'll continue to keep us safe. Bless the services on Sunday. May our hearts be prepared for the message we'll hear at that time. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord bless and keep you.